Shalom Havarim. Welcome, friends in Hebrew. My name is Tony Pino, and today we are going to start part 18 of our series concerning the divinity of Yeshua. But before we begin, let's start out with the blessing of salvation. Let's give all praise and glory and honor to Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah, our Lord, our King, for he's the only way to the Father, and he is the giver of eternal life. So if you know this blessing, go ahead and join in with me. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Nita Lanoet Derech HaYeshua, Ba Mashiach, Yeshua Baruch Hu. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has made the way of salvation through the Messiah Yeshua. Blessed be his name. Amen. Amen. So welcome back to our series, everyone. We are marching through the Tanakh, and we're looking at passages right now in the prophets. We are going to be looking at Yoel today which is Joel, and we are going to be looking at chapter 3. So in Yoel, chapter 3, we are going to begin to look at how Yahweh claims to be the one who sits and judges all people. He will sit and judge the nations, he'll judge all people, but yet when we look at Yeshua, he's going to be the one sitting and judging the nations and judging all people for their deeds and handing out the rewards. And so which is it? Is it Yahweh or is it Yeshua? Well, if Yeshua is divine, if he is also Yahweh, though distinct and separate from the Father, then the passages are coherent. Then they will come together. Proper exegesis will show that it is consistently showing that, yes, Yeshua will be sitting and judging all nations and people, and he is also Yahweh though distinct and separate from the Father. Amen. So let's go to Yoel, Joel chapter 3, to begin our teaching. Amen. So here we are in Yoel, or Joel, chapter 3. Now, I'm going to read some passages in chapter 3, and in some of your Bibles, when I get to some of these other passages, it's going to be in chapter 4. So depending on what Bible your version is, it may all be in chapter 3, or some of what I'm going to read is going to be in chapter 4. In my Bible version, it's going to break it up. I'm going to read a little bit in 3. It's going to go to 4. But again, some of your Bible versions, it's just going to all be in chapter 3, okay? Just to kind of forewarn you. So we want to start with verse 1 in Yoel, chapter 3, and it says, So it will be afterward, I will pour out my ruach on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Also, on the male and female servants will I pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the signs. I'm sorry, I show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. Blood, fire, and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of Yahweh, or the day of Yahweh's coming, okay? Now, within these passages here, of course, we see that they will institute some judging. He's going to be doing some judging on that day, but what is he doing first? He's pouring out his ruach, his spirit upon all flesh. This is a direct correlation with Acts chapter 2, and this is obviously... Uh, for us believers in Yeshua, this is a result of the working of Yeshua, the death and resurrection of Yeshua, him going before the Father, receiving the Father's approval. Now the Spirit is poured out. Well, whose Spirit gets poured out? It says right here, it's my Spirit. This Spirit is the Spirit of the Ruach HaKodesh. The Spirit belongs to the Father. Okay, The Father's Spirit is what is filling you and I. But it is also Yeshua's spirit. Yeshua's spirit is in you. The Father's spirit is in you. The Ruach HaKodesh is the spirit of Messiah, the spirit of Yeshua, and it's the spirit of the Father. How does all the mechanics of this work? Don't have to know. Yeshua and Father Yahweh and the Ruach HaKodesh are uncreated and infinite. We don't know all the anatomy uh, ramifications of how all that, you know, his anatomy works, how all the materialized, uh, you know, um, expressions of Yahweh 
and how that all works. All we know is the Bible makes truthful statements that the Father is uncreated and infinite, Yeshua uncreated and infinite, and of course the Ruach HaKodesh is uncreated and infinite, and the Ruach HaKodesh is the spirit of the Father and the spirit of Yeshua. And we saw that again, we've seen this a few times, but when you go to Romans chapter 8, you see it beautifully. Okay. However, Shaul says, you are not in the flesh, but in the Ruach. If indeed the Ruach Elohim, speaking of the Father, the Ruach of God, dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Ruach of Messiah, he does not belong to him. Notice it's the same spirit, the same spirit. Okay. But if Messiah is in you, well, wait a minute. He said, if the Ruach of God or Ruach of Elohim is in you. So which is it? Is it the spirit of God, the spirit of Elohim in you, or is it the spirit of Messiah, the spirit of Yeshua? It's both. Yes. The one spirit is the spirit of Yeshua and the spirit of the Father. Okay. So verse 10, but if Messiah is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Ruach of the one who raised Yeshua from the dead dwells in you, speaking of the Father's spirit, the one who raised Messiah, Yeshua, from the dead also will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Who's the his spirit who dwells in you? Well, as we can see through the context of chapters 9 and, I mean, verses 9, 10, and 11, it's the Father and Yeshua's spirit that dwells in you. Through his Ruach, who dwells in you, is pointing towards both Yeshua and the Father. So we have a perfect example of triunity here going on in Romans chapter 8. We're seeing that in Yoel chapter 3. Amen. And now let's go a little bit further down to see who's going to be judging. So I need to go into chapter 4, verse 1, but some of you will be staying in chapter 3. And in chapter 4 of Yoel, it goes on to say, For behold, in those days and at that time when I restore Yehuda and Jerusalem from exile, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will plead with them there on behalf of my people and even my inheritance Israel, whom they scattered among the nations, and they divided up my land. They cast lots for my people traded a boy for a prostitute and sold a girl for wine, which they drank. All right, let's skip down to verse seven. Behold, I am arousing them from the place where you sold them, and I will return your retribution up on your head. I will sell your daughters and your sons. It's actually reversed. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Yehuda. And they will sell them to the men of Sheba, to a nation far off, for Yahweh has spoken. Proclaim this among the nations, prepare for war. Stir up the mighty men, let the warriors advance and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning knives into spears. Okay, we're, we're going to look at some passages that actually reverse that here in just a little bit. But this is interesting because you're preparing for war. So now you're beating your plowshares into swords and your prune, pruning knives into spears, okay? Verse 11, Yahweh says, rouse yourself and come all nations around and gather there. Yahweh, bring your mighty ones. Let the nations rouse themselves and go up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all surrounding nations. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, tread, for the wine press is full. The vats overflow, for the wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of Yahweh is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon become dark, the stars withdraw their brightness. Yahweh will roar from Zion and give his voice from Jerusalem. Heaven and earth will shudder. This is a day of judgment. This is a day when who sits and judges? Yahweh sits and judges. Now look at verse 12 and 13. 12 and verse 13 
tell us that Yahweh sits and judges. And then what, where do we get the swinging of the sickle? For the harvest is ripe. Come tread, for the wine press is full, the vats overflow. What is this reminding you of? What is this a prophetic word uh, that is being spoken of in the future? Where else do we see this? We see this in the book of Revelation. So we want to go to the Revelation chapter 14 to see when this judgment is taking place. Revelation 14, starting with verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Pretty interesting. Had his name and his father's name. What name is that? Yahweh. Yahweh is the name of Yeshua. Okay. Prior to coming and taking on the name Yeshua, he was Yahweh. Amen. The Father's name, Yahweh. Yeshua can also be called Yahweh. Do I think that it will say Yeshua and Yahweh on someone's forehead? No, I think it'll be like the high priest who had the four letters across his forehead on the, on the golden plate there. And it had the four letters. It had the name Yahweh there. All right? It's going to be on these 144,000 people on their foreheads. That's my um, assessment and interpretation of this verse. Okay, So let's go down a little bit farther. Notice in verse 4, these are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. Now, when it says virgins, I mean, in my sense of interpreting this verse and how I see the context is it's not like physical virgin, virgins. It's their purity and walking in, in the righteousness of Yeshua, walking in the ways of Yahweh, uh, just like he's coming back for a spotless bride, a virgin bride. Okay, it's talking about the purity aspect of them walking in righteousness. So just to kind of fill you in there. So again, it says, these are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from among mankind as first fruits for God, the father, Yahweh, and the lamb. Not just the father. They're not redeemed for the father, but they're redeemed for the father and the lamb. Notice the equality there. That would not be happening if the lamb was not of the same nature as the father. Amen. You would not be saying that, oh, yeah, they're being redeemed unto me as a human king, you know, a human created being and the father. No, everything points towards Yahweh. Yahweh is the only savior. He's the only redeemer. Besides him, there is no other. So the lamb has to be of the same nature as Yahweh. Amen. And then verse five, it says, and in their mouth was found no lie. They are blameless. All right, let's skip down to verse 14. Verse 14, then I looked and behold, there was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man. He had a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Notice the reference here pointing you back to Yoel chapter four, some of you chapter three, where it's talking about the sharp sickle for the harvest, okay? So this one like the son of man, he had a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple crying out with a loud voice to the one seated on the cloud, put in your sickle and reap for the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. They got the same illusion going on in Yoel 3. So the one seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. Could this be the ones of the righteous? Very much. Very much could be that he was harvesting the righteous ones. Amen. Could this be, of course, at the end of the tribulation period time where he comes back? riding the cloud, amen, and then we are caught up with him in the air to return right back to the ground. There's no going off for, you know, seven years and all that. I'm not a pre-trib 
rapture person. Uh, it will happen at the end, post-trib. We will be caught up in the air with Yeshua and then come straight to the ground. Could this be the harvesting for the one who is seated on the cloud? It's possible. It's a possible way to look at this, all right? And then what happens? Then another angel came out from the temple in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who had authority, has authority over fire, came out from the altar. And he called out with a loud voice to the one holding the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sickle and gather the grape clusters from the vineyard of the earth. Because here grapes are ripe. I'm sorry, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and gathered the clusters from the vineyard of the earth and threw them into the great wine press of the wrath of Yahweh or wrath of God. Could that be alluded to? The wine press is full. Uh, the vats are full over there in Yoel uh, chapter three and four. Absolutely. So could this be the gathering of the wicked? The angels are coming to gather the wicked. I think it can be. Amen. I think it can be. So again, verse 19. So the angel swung a sickle over the earth and gathered the clusters for the vineyard of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was stomped on outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1600 stadia. Okay, it's a certain height. That is uh, going on because the vats are so flow, full, they are overflowing. So again, in Yoel, chapter 3, verse 12, let the nations rouse themselves and go up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all surrounding nations. Okay, this is Yahweh speaking. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come tread, the wine press is full, the vats overflowing, for their wickedness is great. Notice that connection there in Revelation 14, okay? That gathering for the wrath of God, the wrath of Yahweh, amen? And who's doing the judging? Yahweh's doing the judging, okay? Now, in Matthew chapter 13, verses 47 through 50, remember in Revelation 14, he said the angels needed to go out and gather the harvest. They were the one with the sickle and they were gathering the wicked. So let's go ahead and read here verse 47 of Matthew chapter 13. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea, gathering things of every kind. When it was filled, they pulled it ashore and they sat down and gathered up the good into containers, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels, the messengers, will co uh, come forth and separate the wicked from among the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace in that place will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amen. So this is just a condensed version here showing that those angels, the ones with the uh, sickle, will be gathering, uh, you know, gathering them up. Obviously, the wicked are going into the wine press there. We have the one who's seated on the cloud. What is, who does he gather up? He gathers up, I think, my belief is the righteous, so it helps to separate it. Who's going to have authority to separate the righteous from the wicked? Who has that authority? Well, Yahweh sits and judges, but we're going to see here in this teaching that Yeshua is the one doing the judging. Amen? We're going to see that. Now, let's go quickly to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. starting with verse one. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the abyss and a great chain. He sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. He also threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him so that he could not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were complete. After these things, he must release for a short while. He must be released for a short while. Then I saw thrones and peoples sat upon them, those whom authority to judge was given. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded 
because of their testimony for Yeshua and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image, nor had they received his mark or their, on their forehead or on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. How fortunate and holy is the one who has shared in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no authority, but they shall be Kohanim of God and Messiah. Notice the equality there. They shall be holy ones. They shall be priests of Yahweh, Father Yahweh, and the Messiah. And they will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay, notice the equality, putting them on the same equality line there. It's not just they are priests of God, but they are priests of God and the Messiah. Yochanan knows exactly what he's doing, alluding to the divinity of Yeshua in these passages. He's been doing it since the first gospel that he wrote, the gospel of Yochanan, the gospel of John. And now he's doing it in, um, in the book of Revelation. He has that theme, okay? We have that theme also that he says, nobody has seen the Father. We find that in Yochanan's gospel two or three times. We find it in the first, Yochanan chapter 4, verse 12, 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. No one has seen the Father, but who have you been seeing all along? You've been seeing Yeshua. Every time we see in the Tanakh someone seated on the throne, that is Yeshua. Someone who sees Yahweh, they saw Yeshua. Amen. All right, let's continue here in Revelation chapter 20, starting with verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and the one seated on it, the earth and heaven fled from his presence, but no place was found for them. And I saw the dead and great and small standing before the throne. The books were open, and another book was open, the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what was written in the books, according to their deeds. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the death. And Sheol gave up the dead in them. Then they were each judged, each one of them according to their deeds. Then death and Sheol was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death the lake of fire, and if anyone was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Who's the one sitting on the throne here doing all the judging? Why, it's Yeshua. Yeshua is doing the judging. He is rendering decision on whether what? You receive life or death, eternal life or eternal death. He is in charge. What did we see in Yoel? Who would be sitting down judging the nations? Yahweh would doesn't say Yahweh would have his agent sitting on the throne. He says, I will be sitting and judging. Makes no problem if you believe that Yeshua is Yahweh. And yes, he can be distinct and separate from the Father. You still have Yahweh on the throne rendering the decisions. Amen. So let's go back into the Tanakh. I want to show you to just reinforce the fact that it says Yahweh was going to be the one judging. He's the one that judges all people. Then we're going to go, of course, into the Brit Chadashah, and we're going to see more on how that has been given to Yeshua. And Why can it be given to Yeshua? He's Yahweh. He's of the same nature as the Father, though distinct and separate. All right, so let's go to Genesis 18. Genesis 18, we have the Sodom and Gomorrah scene here, and uh, he's standing there with Abraham. Yahweh is standing right next to Abraham, talking to him, all right, letting him know that he's going to go down and check things out, all right, but he's going to destroy that city if it's what basically what he uh, has been told it is. And of course, Abraham says, well, wait a minute, what if there are 50 righteous there? You know, would you still destroy the city if there were righteous people in there? And again, he begins to kind of negotiate with Yahweh and gets it down to 10. All right, but what does it say or what does Abraham say 
about Yahweh. So Abraham says, far be it from you to do such a thing, right? Destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, to cause the righteous to die with the wicked so that the righteous and the wicked share the same fate. Far be it from you shall the judge of the whole world not exercise justice. So Abraham fully realizes Yahweh is judge over the whole world, okay? Not some agent, but Yahweh. So if the agent is also Yahweh, there's no problem. Because a lot of people like to say, well, Yeshua, you know, he's just this human messianic, um, you know, figure that's been promised by Yahweh, promoted, you know, special, unique. He's got this special calling, but he's only human, 100% human. He's not divine. He's, he's a created being. That's what it really comes down to, too. And they're saying, well, he's the divine agent, okay? Uh, they call it in Hebrew, shaliach, okay? Shaliach is, is someone who's been sent by, you know, by a king or someone else, and they speak for that person. They speak for that king. Uh, and so this would be very similar to Yeshua sending out his disciples. They went out in the power and the authority of Yeshua, but you never see someone saying, oh, look, you know, there's the Talmudim of Yeshua. And as they're talking to any one of the 12 or any one of the ones that were sent out, nobody is calling that person Yeshua. Oh, I've seen Yeshua. You know, no, it never happens. They would never allow themselves to be worshipped. They would never allow themselves to be looked upon and spoken of as Yeshua. Amen. Someone could give Yeshua all praise, but they would not be bowing down, praising the Talmudim, saying, thank you, Yeshua. I've seen your face, you know, and they're looking, you know, at uh, Kepha. They're looking at Peter. They're looking at Yochanan. No, they're not going to make that mistake. That's not how far you carry that law of agency over, all right? Even uh, in the days when uh, Yosef, had been risen a second under Pharaoh. It talks about how everything that, you know, Yosef decides to do, he has full authority to do it by Pharaoh, okay? The only one that separates Yosef from Pharaoh is the throne of Pharaoh, okay? That power and authority. Pharaoh is still distinct and separate from Yosef, but can Yosef be a shaliach in a sense? Yes, he can. But how far does that authority carry? Yosef would never walk around saying, I'm Pharaoh, you know, I'm Pharaoh. Me and Pharaoh uh, are one. In other words, Pharaoh is in me and I am in Pharaoh. That would never happen, amen? Nor would any of the uh, servants of the kingdom of Mitzrayim bow down and worship and claim Yosef is Pharaoh. I've seen Pharaoh. If I've seen Yosef, I've seen Pharaoh. You don't see any of that kind of language going on. All right. And so the idea of a shaliach, number one, nowhere in the Tanakh is that word even used. Okay. That word's not even used. Some people see where an illusion of a representative comes from the king or from Pharaoh or something, and they carry this weight. So then they want to defer that on to Yeshua, defer that on to the Messiah. Well, he's just an agent. It's a very weak argument, very weak argument, okay? Because it never defines in those times exactly how far this shaliach can go. And you never see people worshiping, like I said, Yosef, and we don't see examples of people worshiping other, you know, prophets in that saying, I've seen Yahweh. I've seen Pharaoh, and they're looking at the prophet or they're looking at Yosef. It doesn't happen. Amen. So we have to stay focused on the language and the context. We're going to be looking at right now, I mean, Abraham just said right here that Yahweh is judge over what? The whole world. And what do we see just a, a little bit later in this scenario in, in chapter 19? you will see that Yahweh rained down rain and sulfur from Yahweh in heaven. You can already see two Yahwehs, amen? 
a visible and an invisible one. And we've been already talking about the two Yahweh theology, okay? The two power in heaven theology. So this is, this is a very solid exegesis theme that runs through the Tanakh. That there is a visible and invisible Yahweh, and then we see this in the incarnation of Yeshua. All right. So let's keep going so we can see more verses. Deuteronomy 117, you must not show partiality in judgment. You must not hear the small and the great alike. I'm sorry, you must hear the small and great alike. Fear no man, for the judgment is God's. The judgment is God's, not yours. Okay. The judgment is God's. The case that is too hard for you, you shall bring to me and I will hear it. All right. The judgment is God. In other words, Moshe and people, they have to hear from Yahweh. Okay. That's where they get the judgment. It's his judgment. And when they get that judgment, nobody's going to sit there and look at Moses and say, and call Moses Yahweh. They know perfectly the distinction. When it comes to a representative or an agent, they know the distinction. But with Yeshua, there isn't. They will worship him. He will, he will say things that are undeniably making him the same nature as the Father. So just calling him an agent or a shaliach, again, when you go into studying the definition of that, he goes beyond that. Yes, he was sent by the Father. Okay, called by the Father, sent by the Father. He is the Son. He has a different position than the Father. So the idea of calling the Father greater, you know, no one is greater than the Father, that's no problem. Yeshua is in the position of the Son. He always existed as the Son. Then he came down and took on human flesh. Then he was sent forth, born of a woman, took on human flesh. That doesn't change the fact that a difference in position does not necessarily mean a difference in nature, okay? Very key. A difference in position does not necessarily mean a difference in nature when we're talking about Yeshua and the Father. Amen? All right, let's go on. Psalm 7, 9 through 11. Yahweh judges the peoples. Vindicate me, Yahweh, according to my righteousness and integrity in me. Please end the evil of the wicked and sustain the righteous. A just Elohim examines hearts and minds. My shield is Elohim, Savior of the upright in heart. Remember, there's only one Savior. There's only one Yahweh. Besides him, there is no other. Okay? So can we have two distinct gods or two distinct uh, people being Savior and Redeemer? No, you have one Yahweh. And because the one Yahweh within that being is the Father, Son, and the Ruach HaKodesh, yes, all three of them are Savior, Redeemer, the one and only uh, Yahweh, okay, the one and only God. And so, no problem. You can still have Yahweh is the only God, or, you know, besides me, there is no other, and it can include Father, Son, and Ruach HaKodesh, because they are of the same nature, 100% God, each one of them, though distinct and separate from one another, and you have one Yahweh. So we have people that will say, you know, well, I don't understand the mechanics of all that. Can you please show me how the fact that you're telling me they're all 100% Yahweh, and they're distinct and separate, but they're not parts of each other. How can you tell me that? How can you prove that? I don't have to prove it. He's infinite and uncreated. The statements and reality in the, the Bible in, in context show that Yeshua is Yahweh. The Father is Yahweh. The Ruach HaKodesh is Yahweh. And when we're talking about judging here, it's always saying that Yahweh will judge the people. And then when we get to the Brech HaDashah, who do we see? We're going to see Yeshua judging the people. All right, let's go on. Psalm 50, verses 4 through 6. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth to judge his people. Gather my uh, Kodeshim. Kodeshim here is holy ones or holy people. Some people will say Kedoshim. Okay? My holy people to me. 
who cut a covenant with me with a sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness, for Elohim himself is judge. Elohim himself is judge. Doesn't say agent, right? So Yeshua has to be Yahweh, not just an agent, for this to be true, that God will judge, be the judge himself. That means he's not dependent on someone else to render a decision for him. Amen. So if Yeshua is Yahweh, no problem. All right. Psalm Tehillah 96, 12 through 13. Let the land exalt and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy before Yahweh, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Okay. Notice it's Yahweh coming. All right. Yeshayahu, Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 9 through 11. Get yourself up on a high mountain, you who bring good news to Zion, or Zion. Lift up your voice with strength, you who bring good news to Jerusalem. Lift it up. Do not fear, says the cities of Judah. Yehuda in Hebrew. Behold your Elohim. Look, Yahweh Elohim comes with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. His arm, okay, this arm ruling for him, okay, it's not just his power. All, oftentimes you say, oh, this happened by the finger of God or the mighty outstretched arm of Yahweh, okay? It's actually speaking of a person. And that person is Yeshua. And the only way to, co to be coherent with all the scriptures where Yahweh himself judges is if Yeshua, who is the right arm or right hand of Yahweh, who pre-existed with him, is also Yahweh. So the only way you can be coherent throughout all the scriptures. Otherwise, you contradict. If you depend on the Shaliach law of agency here, it falls apart. It can't hold. Amen. It goes beyond the definitions that we see given to it. Okay. All you got to go is go to Jewish law, look up Shaliach, look up the limitations, look up the, um, the way it's defined and how it was used. Yeshua goes beyond that. Amen. Nobody would look at just a created finite being who comes in the name of a king and look at them and call them that king's name. That person's authority doesn't carry so much that there's no difference between them and the king whatsoever. I mean, are you going to tell me that that agent can now go have relations with the king's wives and concubines now because he carries that same authority? No, not at all. Amen. There are limits to what a shaliach can do. And Yeshua goes beyond those limits. Amen. So he says again in verse 10, look, Yahweh Elohim comes with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and he is recompensed before him. Like a shepherd, he tends his flock. He gathers the lambs in his arms, carries them in his bosom, and gently guides nursing ewes. Amen. All right, let's go on. All right, Yermayahu, Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 31. A noise has come to the end of the earth, for Yahweh has a dispute with the nations. He is passing judgment on all flesh. He is doing it. As for the wicked, he has given them over to the sword. It is a declaration of Yahweh. He has specifically done it, okay? Let's go on. Romans chapter th 2, verse 3. But you, O oh man, judging those practicing such things, yet do the same, do you suppose that you will escape the judgment of God? This is God the Father, Theos, all right, Yahweh. Do you? 
Does Shaul know who's going to do the judging? Sure, he knows Yahweh's going to do the judging. Amen? All right, our final verse here in the Tanakh that we're going to look at before jumping to the Brit Hadashah, and that is 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2, look at verse 10. Those who oppose Yahweh will be shattered. He thunders against them in heaven. He judges the ends of the earth. He gives strength to his king, exalting the horn of his anointed one. Okay? He's the one doing the judging. Now, if what? If Yeshua, who is king, who is high priest, is also Yahweh, then this poses no threat. Okay? Poses no threat. Remember, a difference in position does not necessarily mean a difference in nature. Amen? So he can be everything that the Messiah was called to be. He can be everything that the king is called to do. And he can be everything that Yahweh says will happen and do. He can be all at one time. Amen? And yet distinct and separate from the Father. Doesn't violate any scripture. And it doesn't violate the nature of Yahweh. Amen? The nature of Yahweh. He's uncreated and infinite. Keep that in mind. Can we ever fully exhaust the nature of Yahweh? No, we only know it by how he uh, gives us that revelation, how he, he uh, reveals it to us through progressive revelation. And again, people want to be able to uh, be able to work it out with their human logic. You got to be able to show me how, you know, this three is not broken up into parts. No, we don't have to do that, all right? Because we are finite, he is infinite. If the finite could ever fully explain the infinite, then the infinite is no longer infinite. And so, no, we don't have to. But this is the, this is the crux of the matter for many people who don't believe that Yeshua is of the same nature as the Father. They don't believe it because they can't reason it out with their human logic. And until they feel like they have done that, they won't step over the line and believe that he is also Yahweh. Amen. All right, let's go to the Brit Hadashah. The Brit Hadashah, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 16. All right, so it says, For the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will repay everyone according to his deeds. Okay? We just saw it's it's Yahweh that does all the judging. But then we saw that someone's going to be seated on the throne in Revelation chapter 20 who's going to what? Be the one giving out eternal life, uh rewarding people for their deeds. Who's going to be doing that? It didn't tell you a name who was sitting on the throne in Revelation 20, but now we know. Matthew chapter 16 says, The Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father. Not some similar glory or lesser glory. No, the glory of his Father. The same glory. All right? The only way that can happen is if he is also Yahweh. Amen? Coming with the angels, we, we talked about that with the sickle and gathering the wicked and the righteous, right? This is alluding to all that here. All right, let's continue. Matthew 25. Now, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne, right? Who do we see being seated on thrones? Being seated on the throne in book of Revelation, it's the one that's going to be doing the judging. It's Yeshua. All nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another, just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. 
I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Now notice the key though. Yeshua is doing the separating. He is the one seated on the throne, separating the nations, separating those, what? The sheep and the goats, okay? He's separating them. But the word of Yahweh says he will do all that. So which is it? Well, if Yeshua is Yahweh, it's both. All right, so let's go to Ezekiel chapter 34, starting with verse 11. And we're going to see similarities to Yeshua being uh, the one separating the people, the sheep and the goats. We're going to see all that here in Ezekiel chapter 34, starting with verse 11. For thus says Yahweh Elohim, here I am. I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his sheep on the day he is among his scattered flock. So I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them out of all the places where they have been scattered on a day of cloud and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the people. I will gather them from the countries. I will bring them back into their own land. I will shepherd them upon the mountains of Israel by the streams and in all the habitation. Uh, habitable places of the land. I will shepherd them in good pasture. Their grazing place will be on the high mountains of Israel. There they will lie down on good grazing ground. They will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will tend my flock and make them lie down. It is a declaration of Yahweh. I will seek the lost, bring back the stray, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will tend them with justice. As for you, my flock, thus says Yahweh Elohim, before I will judge, I'm sorry, behold, I will judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. Was it too little for you that you were feeding in the good pasture? Must you trample down the rest of your pasture with your feet? You were drinking clear water. Must you muddy the rest? Of your feet, yet my sheep must eat what you have trampled with your feet and drink what you have muddied with your feet. Amen. So notice he is seeking the lost, right? Verse 16, bringing back the stray, binding up the broken. Who's doing that? Yeshua was doing that. Yeshua was doing that to the people of Israel. I will destroy, I will tend them with justice. Who is the one that judges in the Brich Hadashah? It is Yeshua. As for my flock, thus says Yahweh Elohim, behold, I will judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. What did we just see in Matthew chapter 25? Matthew chapter 25. Let's go back there and look real quick. Matthew 25. Now when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will gather before him, and he will separate from one another, just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. So who is doing the judging? Yeshua does the judging. He will be judging all. Amen. All. And it was saying specifically in Ezekiel chapter 34 that Yahweh would be doing this, okay? Notice here in the scriptures where it states that the Father won't be doing the judging, that he's given all judgment over to the Son. So let's go ahead and look at that verse. Yochanan, John, the one who always talks about the deity of Yeshua, all right? He lets it be known right um, without a shadow of a doubt, I should say. It says here in chapter five of Yochanan, the father does not judge anyone, but has handed over all judgment to the son. So he doesn't judge anyone, but yet in the Tanakh passages, it says Yahweh will be sitting doing the judging. 
Yahweh is going to be, you know, judging the people over and over and over again. Now we're being told the father's not going to judge anyone, but has handed over all judgment to the son. Well, if he's just an agent, just some human being, he's not the father. He's not Yahweh. So then those passages mean nothing. But if the son is also Yahweh, then that, those passages are coherent. They flow. They flow. He cannot be just a shaliach. He cannot be just a messenger. Amen. A representative. Yahweh is going to give just a finite created being all power to judge eternal life for all his creation. He's not going to do it himself. He's going to let all that be handled by a created being. I don't think so. I don't think so. No Pharaoh would do that. No, uh, you know, King would do that when it comes down to something that serious, he's going to be there. He's going to do it. Well, the father can hand it over to Yeshua. if He's of the same nature as the father. Amen. No problem. It fulfills those verses perfectly. Let's go ahead and go down. Acts chapter 10, and he commanded us to proclaim to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of all the living and the dead. Did the father give him the authority and power to do the judging? Absolutely. Absolutely. He gave him the power and authority to do it. Amen. And in order for those verses to be fulfilled, that Yahweh is doing the judging himself, as it specifically says, he's got to be greater than just some shaliach. Okay, he's got to be greater. Nobody's going to be bowing down to just a created finite being calling him Yahweh. I've seen Yahweh, thank you, you know, uh, and judging directly in the case of your eternal life if he's not also Yahweh. Doesn't carry that same, if he's not also your creator. Amen the creator of all things. Acts 17, 31. For he has set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed. He has brought forth evidence of this to all men by raising him from the dead. So people will get stuck on this one and say, see, he's judging through a man. Okay. Was Yeshua man and Yahweh, God? Absolutely. He was not just a man. So can you say through a man? Sure. Absolutely. He didn't stop, he didn't stop being man now that he's up there seated on the throne. Okay. He still has both natures. All right. But what is he operating in? Amen. The divine nature when he's judging. Amen. So he's just saying this doesn't nullify, oh, he's just a man. For he set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man. Through a man. So let's look up the word here in the Greek. Acts chapter 17. All right, so here we are in Acts 17.31. And when we click on the word through, through a man, okay, it shows the, uh, the verb form n, that man is doing it, okay? So he is, um, it says here in the NAS, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Notice the context here. Why is he using the word man? Because Jesus, the man, was what? Raised from the dead. Okay. This would not exclude all the other verses where it proves that he is also Yahweh. He is the God man. Amen. Does Yahweh have to really make sure? Well, let me really make sure I say God man here. No. Within Acts here, Luke is just making a truthful statement. It doesn't mean that that's what it all encompasses, that it can only be a man, and that's it. No, you don't just build a whole doctrine off of one verse. Just because it says, through a man, 
I'm in full agreement, yet I know that Yeshua, through all kinds of other passages, is shown to be Yahweh. He is the God-man. So it's not a problem. Some people get so fixated, they want to go and look at all the verses that just point to Yeshua as a man, okay, and then ignore all the verses that point to him as Yahweh. He's the God-man. So the authors, they can rightfully say he's a man, and they can rightfully say he's Yahweh. They don't have to make sure they use both in every time they, they say the phrase. They don't have to make sure of that. There's no rule that says they have to do that. Amen. We got to do proper exegesis from Genesis to Revelation, not just pick and choose what verses we like. We got to put them all together. Amen. All right, so as we begin to bring this teaching to a close, I need um, a little bit more time here to finish this out. We want to go to Revelation chapter 2. And what I want to do is I want to show you that within the book of Revelation, there are basically three thrones that you see in the book of Revelation. Okay, And so one of them, of course, is the throne of Satan. Okay, And that's found right here in Revelation chapter 2, verse 13. It says, I know where you live, where Satan's throne is, yet you continue to hold firm to my name. And you did not deny your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan resides. All right, so we have Satan's throne there. Of, of course, um, throne does not necessarily have to mean literal, but it can mean authority, okay? But uh, we do have pictures sometimes where we see where it literally says someone is seated on a throne. Okay, that's going to be slightly different than just saying, here, here's where Satan's throne is. This is where his main seat of authority is. Okay? We don't really picture or see Satan seated on a particular throne. All right? uh, just want to kind of throw that out there. Now let's go to the next chapter, chapter 3 of Revelation. Chapter 3, verse 22. All right, so we're going to start at Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, not 22 uh, here. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, we have to be careful because in some Bible versions, the verses and everything are not exactly the same as all Bible versions people use. So I had to relook this one up real quick. So it's Revelation chapter 3, and the TLV, it's verses 20 through 22. Okay, It may be different in some other versions. So it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. To the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to sit with me on my throne. Notice they're not being invited to just sit on the throne. They can sit with him on the throne. Okay, Just as I myself overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. All right, He who came has an ear. Let him hear what the Ruach is saying to the Messiah's community. So there's a distinction there. Okay, remember, a difference in position is not a difference in nature. So there is a distinction of being invited to come and sit with Yeshua on his throne, and only Yeshua can sit with the Father on his throne. Amen. Not, not saying us, all right? And so there's that equality going on of what I believe to be nature. And of course, the Father has handed all authority over to Yeshua. Amen. And so one thing that we have to keep in mind, though, is nowhere in the Bible do we see the Father seated on a throne. We don't see him seated on a throne. Amen. Anytime you see someone seated on a throne, who is it? It's who? Yeshua. Even when you look at um, Yeshayahu, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, all right, who did Isaiah see seated on the throne? He saw Yahweh seated on the throne in his full glory, amen, uh, you know, that's where he said, you know, I am undone, um, and so when we go to Yochanan, of course, chapter 12, verses 33 through like 45, right in there, it literally says that Isaiah saw his glory, and spoke of him. Who's the him there in Yochanan, John chapter 12? It's Yeshua. 
So Isaiah may have seen Yahweh, but Yochanan is saying, yes, he saw Yahweh, but it was Yeshua whom he saw in his full glory. And it really comes out nicely in the Greek Septuagint. When you read the Greek Septuagint um, in verse 1 and 2 of Yeshayahu, Isaiah chapter 6, you really see Isaiah was looking at the glory of Yahweh. And then when you go to Yochanan chapter 12, you can see, yeah, that was Yeshua whom he saw in verses 45. I mean, I'm sorry, like 44 and 45. He saw Yeshua. Amen. And so we have three thrones going on here, okay, in the Bible. But throughout the Bible, you're only going to see Yeshua seated on a throne. Okay. Now, when we get into Revelation chapter 4, starting with verse 1, after these things, I looked, and behold, a door was standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard uh, speaking with me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. Now, was he literally taken up or was this like a vision or is this like, um, you know, not in, uh, not total physical form, like a vision or out of body experience or something of that nature. I would more lean towards that way, either a vision or out of body experience, not necessarily him in his flesh being taken up. That's just my, my opinion. You can, you're welcome to disagree with it, but he was immediately, he says, immediately I was in the Ruach, in the spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven. Okay, a throne was standing in heaven and one seated on the throne. And the one who was seated was like Jasper and carnelian in appearance and a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders dressed in white clothes with golden crowns on their heads and out from the throne comes flashes of lightning and rumbling and crashes of thunder and seven torches of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. Now, these seven spirits, notice this, these seven spirits make up the Ruach HaKodesh. They're not literally seven distinct and separate spirits. No, seven spirits, the perfection of the Ruach HaKodesh. Okay, that's what that's going to uh, lean towards there. Now, when we look at, you know, who's, when we're thinking about who's this seated on the throne, who's this one seated on the throne, and we've got, all of this expression going on on what it looks like. Please remember, Yochanan, the one who's writing this, has already, you know, he said three to four times, all right, within his own writings, no one has ever seen the Father. No one has seen the Father. So this one who's seated on the throne is not going to be the Father, okay? But the one and only who? God or Son, the one and only, unique, Son, unique God, who is what? At the Father's side, in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. So all throughout time, and I do have a teaching on this on my YouTube channel where I go over these verses and show you that, no, nobody has seen the Father. I'll take you to all the passages where people claim to have seen Yahweh, and we can see they had saw who? Yeshua. They saw Yeshua. It wasn't the Father. Because Yochanan is very clear, no one has seen the Father. Amen. And so who is seated on the throne here? Well, within Western Christianity and the Western churches, right away, they think of the Father. They think of the Father right away. But I would caution you to really think about this and look at the passages, and we got to put all passages from the Bible together. And I think the one seated on the throne here is Yeshua. Amen is Yeshua. Now, could he be seated on the Father's throne? Sure. He could be seated on the Father's throne. In other words, he has all authority to judge. He's been given all authority. The Father will not judge, as we saw earlier in the passages here. All right. And so what this reminds me of, real quick, is we got to go to Ezekiel chapter, I believe it's chapter one. So let's go ahead and go there. All right. So Ezekiel chapter one, and we see here 
that uh, in the 13th year, on the fifth day of the fourth month, as I was among the exiles by the river uh, Chabar, the heavens opened and I saw visions of Elohim. I saw visions of Elohim. Amen. And when we go down to, I believe it's verse 26, we see the throne. Okay. It says, above the expanse, over their heads was something like a throne, resembling a sapphire stone. Above the shape of the throne was a figure of human appearance. Okay. Human appearance. So this is Yahweh in a human appearance. Nobody has ever seen Yahweh. Remember, Yochanan says this. From what appeared at his waist upward, I saw a glowing metal looking like a fire encased in a frame. From what was like his waist down, I saw the appearance of fire radiating around him. Like the appearance of the rainbow in the cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the radiance. It was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Yahweh. I saw it, fell upon my face, and heard the voice of the one who was speaking. Very similar to the throne we're seeing right here. Very similar to the throne we're seeing right here in the book of Revelation. Let's go ahead and go back to the book of Revelation. Okay, Revelation chapter four, where he says, immediately I was in the rock and behold, the throne was standing in heaven and one seated on the throne. Okay, and the one seated on the throne was like Jasper and carnelian in appearance and a rainbow was around the throne. Notice the similarities from Ezekiel. Like an emerald in appearance, around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders dressed in white clothes and golden crowns on their heads. And out from the throne come flashing of lightning and rumblings and clashes of thunder and seven torches of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And therefore the throne was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. In the middle of the throne and around it were four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like an ox. The third living creature had a face like a, lamb, like a man. And the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes all around and within. They do not rest day or night, chanting, Kadosh, 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 Adonai, Elohe, Zabaot, Asher, Haya, Ve, Hove, Ve, Ve, Yabo. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, who was and who is and who is to come. Who is that describing? I believe that's describing Yeshua. Yeshua is the I am. He is the first and the last, and he is the who was and who is and who is to come. Amen. So who are they seeing seated on this throne? I believe it's Yeshua. Okay. A lot of people will say it's the Father, and I think that will be mistaken because no one has ever seen the Father. So can this be Yeshua? Absolutely it can. Amen. Let's continue. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to the one seated on the throne who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before the one seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they throw their crowns down before the throne chanting, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. Did Yeshua create all things? Absolutely he did. Did the father create all things? Yep, he sure did. But no one has ever seen the father. They're bowing down and worshiping who? I believe they're worshiping Yeshua, who is our Lord and God. Just like Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Okay? You created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. Amen? Let's continue on. And I saw in the right hand of the one seated upon the throne a scroll written on both the front and the back, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. I began to weep loudly because no one was worthy 
to open the scroll or to look into it. Notice the focus is not upon the one who's seated on the throne, but now the focus is all on who is worthy to open this scroll. Okay. What I believe you are seeing here is Yeshua as judge. He's seated on the throne, right? Some people will say, well, that's the Father's throne. Yes, but you're going to see Yeshua seated there. It represents authority. It represents judgment, okay? It represents, you know, uh, all authority. Everything has been given to the Son. And so I don't have a problem with this being Yeshua. I think it's a strong argument, all right? People have just naturally gone right to the Father without even questioning it or thinking about it. But when you put all these other verses together, it could be Yeshua. And I think there's a strong argument for it. So verse five, then one of the elders tells me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. So now we're seeing the one that is worthy to open it. We're talking about the Messiah, Yeshua. So they're saying, see, that can't be the Messiah seated on the throne. We've got the Messiah right here, and uh, he's worthy to open the scroll. Well, you have Yeshua plays more and more than one position or role. He is judge over all things, so he can be seated on the throne, and he is redeemer. He is Messiah. So having two pictures and the, the manifestation of those two pictures is actually the same person, that's not, that's not outside of Hebraic thought. That's within Hebrew culture that you can see that happening within their culture and within their thought. In a few minutes, I'm going to talk about Daniel chapter 7. And remember, in our series, if you haven't seen it already, I go through that, you know, even in more detail. Um, and I can't remember which one it is, whether it's number 16, I think it's number 16 or 17, um, where we go through Daniel chapter 7. We're going to touch on that here in just a few moments. But so here in verse 5, it says that when, I'm sorry, then one of the elders tells me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Yehuda, Judah, the root of David has triumphed. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. And in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders, I saw a lamb standing as having been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of God sent out in all, into all the earth. Notice, not only does the throne have surrounding it the, the seven spirits, but it's surrounding the Lamb. The Ruach HaKodesh is the spirit of Yeshua. If you do not have Yeshua in you, then you are not what? Yahweh's. You are not his. You have to have the spirit of Yeshua and the Spirit of the Father in you, which is the Ruach HaKodesh, which is the seven spirits here. Notice it's symbolism here. Things, when they are symbolism, we don't have to take them as a reality um, of something in the sense of, yeah, there were literal seven spirits there. They were symbolizing something, representing something. The one seated on the throne represents what? The person who is in all judgment, who has all authority doesn't necessarily have to be the father. It can be Yeshua sitting there, all right? And then we have the lamb because Yeshua as a man, as redeemer, he is what? The lamb of God, amen? And so I think we're seeing two pictures of the same person here. Let's go ahead and continue reading. Verse eight, when he had taken the scroll, from the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a sharp and golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the Kedoshim. And they are singing a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. All right. Makes sense. He's the redeemer. He's the lamb. You were slain and by your blood, you redeemed for God, for the father. Amen those from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them for our God, okay? For Yahweh, Father Yahweh, a kingdom and a Kohanim, and they shall reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. Their numbers was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. They were chanting with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. 
and I have heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and everything in them responding to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. So I hold that this to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb is not the father and Yeshua, it's Yeshua. Okay, it's two different roles, obviously judge, right? Holding the, holding the scroll there, holding everything together, and then the lamb. Well, both of those have been given over to Yeshua. Amen. Yeshua holds all of that power. Amen. The Father is not going to judge anyone. All right. So the idea in Hebraic thought of the throne and that and the lamp two being the same thing. Again, we also see this in Daniel. Okay. We see this in Daniel chapter seven, verse 13. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, it says, I was watching in the night visions. Behold, one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days and was brought into his presence. Dominion, glory, and sovereignty were given to him that all peoples, nations, and language uh, should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will never pass away, and his kingdom is the one that will not be destroyed. All right, so we have the son of man coming on the clouds and he approaches the ancient of days my suggestion is all right because we've got thrones there and everything no one has ever seen the father so who is this ancient of days well right away people think oh it's the father because look at ancient of days but then again yeshua is called what he's called the father of eternity in isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 it's one of the titles of the messiah that would make it look like he's old, amen, in that sense. Ancient of days can be just a title of someone who what? Always existed. You don't have to picture some old man or something right away when we say ancient of days. It just shows that he always existed. And the son always existed with the father, amen. So you have the son of man coming with the clouds, okay, representing what? The Messiah. It's representing the Messiah. It's representing Yeshua. Who could also be the ancient of days? It could be Yeshua, okay? He's the one that's going to do all judging. He judges all the people in all the ways. Ancient of days. You've got Micah chapter five, where it talks about the Messiah coming from Bethlehem. And it, it, it's talking about he's from the days of old, amen? From eternity. It's talking about he never had a beginning. So this ancient of days can also be pointing towards the Messiah. And the Messiah had no beginning he's never been created amen he's the judge of all things now you may ask um you know this you keep telling me this is like jewish thought hebraic thought we do have some scholarly quotes that i can show you here especially for daniel chapter 7 all right i don't have any for revelation 12 okay that this is in revelation um sorry revelation chapters 4 and 5 all right I'm carrying the theme of Jewish thought there. Jewish thought and the verses, of course, that say no one has ever seen the Father and, and also standing on the foundation that every place we saw Yahweh, where if someone saw Yahweh in the Tanakh, they saw Yeshua. So if they are seeing somebody seated on the throne in Revelation 4 and 5, there's a good chance that that was Yeshua. But this idea of seeing two figures, but yet both figures mean the same person, Yes, that was uh, within more, uh, more towards the east, okay? More towards the east than is the west. The west had that philosophy because it's more Greek-minded in the west. So, you know, they got to separate the father and the son. They got to have all these things that are separated where it's not a problem in the Hebrew mind to see a picture of something and it means the same thing. Two different things, but mean the same thing or same person. All right, let's go to a scholar, an Aramaic scholar, by the name of Victor Alexander. Victor Alexander. All right, Victor Alexander, he wrote a commentary on the book of Daniel. And again, he is an Aramaic scholar. 
a believer in Yeshua, a believer in the deity of Yeshua. And he writes uh, in a footnote uh, in his commentary on Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, he writes that the immediate uh, idiomatic construction presents themselves before him. In his note 713, it says, number two, in order to separate the Lord Jesus from the Godhead, the Western theologians needed to distort the scripture. In this passage, they refer to the ancient one and allude to Jesus as being the present before him. In other words, before God the Father. In this way, they could demote the Son and put themselves on the same level with Jesus after he appears in the New Testament. Whereas the original scriptures clearly present one God and the Lord the Messiah being his manifestation throughout the scriptures, old and new. Okay, so it's combining this to mean that it is Yeshua. Okay, not the Father and Yeshua, but Yeshua. All right, we also have another um, Old Testament scholar by the name of Christopher J.H. Wright. He writes, but on the other hand, the Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7 is closely associated with God himself. Daniel sees him coming with the clouds of heaven. That was very much part of the ambiance of deity in the Old Testament. Furthermore, he is given authority, glory, power, and worship, and his kingdom is eternal. All rather more than the normal a uh, lot of any son of Adam. In fact, there are Greek versions of the text which translate Daniel 7.13 in such a way as to identify the Son of Man with the Ancient of Days. And this tradition finds a strong echo in Revelation where the description of Jesus is in glory is a combination of the reference to the Son of Man and a virtual direct quotation of the description of the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7.9. The, descript, the two descriptions are conflated into one picture. So they're conflated into one picture, meaning the Ancient of Days is Yeshua, and the Son of Man coming right in on the clouds is Yeshua. It's just two ways of speaking of the same person. All right, he's in different roles. What I'm suggesting to you is in Revelation chapter 4, when you read that, go ahead and read it and study it. There is a strong argument and possibility that the one seated on the throne with the scroll is Yeshua. And then it's Yeshua that comes and takes the scroll from his hand. Why? Because the focus is the scroll, not so much who's seated on the throne. And who has the authority and a power to take the scrolls and initiate that into existence, all right, to open the scrolls and begin the prophecy? Well, Yeshua does. So this type of tension, though, you know, in the Greek mindset can be hard to comprehend. In Jewish thought, in Hebrew thought, it wouldn't be. They wouldn't have a problem with it. I'll leave you with this final example before we close. And thank you for bearing with me. I needed to kind of really map this out before we close. All right, so in John, Yochanan, chapter 3, again, helping to show the, the deity of Yeshua here. Always going to the book of Yochanan quite often here. All right, so in chapter 3, we see Yeshua using the same type of uh, thinking where you use two different things to mean one, one and the same thing, okay? So Yeshua answered, amen, amen, I tell you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. Do not be surprised that I said to you, you all must be born from above. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Notice the focus is the Spirit. But why is the term water used? Well, I can tell you this. Many within Western Christianity will use this to, to talk about how you need to be water baptized. They take the water literally, and they take it into that sense of water. When oftentimes in the Bible, the water can be a idiom, a reflection of the Spirit. So it's not something different than the Spirit. 
that you've got the spirit there and then the water, they're not two totally different things going on within these passages. They're one and the same. One and the same. They have the exact same meaning. So that's why, again, for me, that that's like a he, that's Hebrew thought, Hebrew way of thinking. It doesn't, it doesn't bother them to to it doesn't, the tension is not there, in other words. So looking at the ancient of days. Right away, your natural thought is, oh, that's the Father. Well, let's think about what, the, what describes the Messiah, too, the Son of Man, all right? And just because you see the Son of Man, that doesn't eliminate, oh, it can't be the Son of Man. So when we see water here, oh, that can't be the Spirit because it's water. You get where I'm, you kind of see where I'm going with this, all right? The two can be the, meaning the same thing or the same person, okay? Context is king. Remember that. Context is king. We've got several passages. No one has ever seen the Father. Who have they been seeing all along? Who's been making him known all along? Yeshua has. Who has the authority? Um, been given all authority? Yeshua has. By the Father? It's been given to Yeshua. Is Yeshua of the same essence and nature as the Father, though distinct and separate? Absolutely. Colossians 1.15 says the Father is invisible. All right, Yeshua is the image of the invisible Yahweh. Okay, we say he's spirit. That's just finite human terms. Okay, because we've got created spirits and we can see those, right? But Yahweh was before creation. Okay, he's invisible. Can he take on a body? Can he come in a spirit form? Sure, he can. But I think the Father has always remained the way he is, okay? And everything we see is the Son. He's sent the Son, given the Son authority. The Son is doing the work and will of the Father, amen, all throughout the Scriptures. That's how I see and interpret Scripture, amen? All right, so we'll go ahead and end here. Sorry about it being so long. There was a lot of information to give. Next time together, we're going to do Micah chapter 5. And as we end here today, let's go ahead and end with the ironic blessing. Amen. We'll say it in Hebrew first, and then we'll say it in English. Yevarechecha Yahweh be'ishmerecha. Ya'er Yahweh pa'anav elecha ve'unika. Yisa Yahweh pa'anav elecha ve'asem lecha shalom. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face shine to you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Shalom, everyone.